three rings for the elven kings under the sky, seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone, nine for mortal men doomed to die, one for the dark lord on his dark throne, in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. It is a verse well known to readers of The Lord of the Rings, and is summarized quite nicely in the iconic Fellowship of the Ring prologue. But why does one prominent race seem to be neglected? And just for fun, what would happen if they weren't? So today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover why there are no rings of power for the hobbits. Over the past three years of running this channel, I've gotten the question countless times in the comments, why weren't there any rings of power made with hobbits in mind? To get a full picture of the answer, we must go back to the creation of the rings, where we discover that not only were hobbits not the intended recipients, but neither were dwarves or men. After being rejected by Gil-galad and Elrond of Linden in 1200 of the Second Age, Sauron infiltrates a region, home of the great jewel smiths. Over the next 300 years, they would learn from this being known as Anatar, before reaching the height of their power and forging 16 great rings of power. When Sauron leaves, going to Mordor to forge his one ring in secret, Celebrimbor makes three more rings with the knowledge he had learned from Anatar, but without the Dark Lord's involvement. Sauron returns to Mount Doom, where he forges his master ring, whose design was to bring all others under its sway. However, the elves wearing their rings perceive Sauron's treachery and immediately remove their rings. Gandalf tells us that the smiths heard Sauron's words, the very words inscribed upon the One Ring itself. Ajnaj Durbatuluk, Ajnaj Gimbatul, Ajnaj Strakatuluk, Agburzum Ishi, Kripatul. And here is where Sauron's initial plan failed. For despite what the full ring verse has led many to believe, Sauron's plan was not to use representatives from all races. All 16 he made with Celebrimbor were intended for the elves. We see in a rare piece of dialogue from Sauron himself that the rings were pitched to the elves so that many lands of Middle-earth could be fair and beautiful. Alas for the weakness of the great, for a mighty king is Gil-galad, and wise in all law is Master Elrond, and yet they will not aid me in my labors. Can it be that they do not desire to see other lands become as blissful as their own? But wherefore should Middle-earth remain forever desolate and dark, whereas the elves could make it as fair as Erasea, nay, even as Valinor? And since you have not returned thither as you might, I perceive that you love this Middle-earth, as do I. Is it not then our task to labor together for its enrichment? and for the raising of all the elven kindreds that wander here, untaught to the height of that power and knowledge which those have who are beyond the sea. This proposition is embraced by the Gwaithi Myrdine, and indeed would prove to be a desire among many elves, to see their lands become as beautiful as the home they long ago left. Therefore they hearken to Sauron, and they learn from him many things, for his knowledge was great. In those days, the smiths of Austin Ethel surpassed all that they had contrived before, and they took thought, and they made rings of power. But Sauron guided their labors, and he was aware of all that they did, for his desire was to set a bond upon the elves and to bring them under his vigilance. So Sauron's original intention is to enslave the elves, bringing them under the dominion of the One Ring. It is after his betrayal is discovered that the Dark Lord resolves to reclaim the rings. While the three elven rings would elude him, Sauron takes possession of the 16 after sacking Eregion. With the elves fully aware of his malicious intent, Sauron only now turns to the other races of Middle-earth. Sauron gathered into his hands all the remaining rings of power, and he dealt them out to the other peoples of Middle-earth hoping thus to bring under his sway all those that desired secret power beyond the measure of their kind. Seven rings he gave to the dwarves, but to men he gave nine, for men proved in this matter as in others the readiest to his will. And all those rings that he governed he perverted, the more easily since he had a part in their making, 
and they were accursed, and they betrayed in the end all those that used them. The dwarves indeed proved tough and hard to tame. They ill endure the domination of others, and the thoughts of their hearts are hard to fathom, nor can they be turned to shadows. They use their rings only for the getting of wealth, but wrath and an overmastering greed of gold were kindled in their hearts, of which evil enough after came to the prophet of Sauron. As Sauron turns to the dwarves, giving them seven of his sixteen rings, his purpose once again fails. He did not foresee the dwarves for their hardiness and their nature to resist the domination of others. Indeed, the only part of Sauron's plan that works, aside from his ruling ring, is the distribution of the Nine to great leaders among men. Those who used the Nine Rings became mighty in their day, kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old. They obtained glory and great wealth, yet it turned to their undoing. They had, as it seemed, unending life, yet life became unendurable to them. They could walk, if they would, unseen by all eyes in this world beneath the sun, and they could see things in worlds invisible to mortal men but too often they beheld only the phantoms and delusions of Sauron. And one by one, sooner or later, according to their native strength and to the good or evil of their wills in the beginning, they fell under the thraldom of the ring that they bore and under the domination of the One, which was Sauron's. And they became forever invisible save to him that wore the ruling ring. And they entered into the realm of shadows. The Nazgul were they, the ring wraiths the enemy's most terrible servants. Darkness went with them, and they cried with the voices of death. This leads us to our original question. Why are there no rings of power given to the halflings? The most practical answer is Sauron at this time didn't even know of their existence. The given date for the first appearance of the Nine as the Nazgul is 2251 of the Second Age meaning Sauron likely handed out the 16 rings much earlier, considering the elongated life these nine men had prior to becoming wraiths. While hobbits may have existed even as early as the First Age, they do not enter into the histories of Arda until 1050 of the Third Age, when the arrival of a shadow in Dol Guldur, later revealed to be Sauron himself, leads them to migrate westward. So here we get our first reason Sauron didn't give rings of power to hobbits. He didn't know of their existence, nor did anyone else for that matter. But if Sauron had known about hobbits at this time, there's almost certainly no chance he would approach them with rings of power. Unlike dwarves and men, the hobbits do not possess great realms or have mighty armies that could oppose him. There would quite simply be nothing Sauron could gain or perceive to gain from making halflings part of his grand plan. But for the sake of fun, let's say Sauron did give rings to the hobbits. Many like to pencil in five because, well, it's an odd number that fits in the sequence. What would happen if a group of hobbit lordlings were given rings of power? In Return of the King, we see the vision given to Sam from the influence of the One Ring itself. Already the ring tempted him, gnawing at his will and reason. Wild fantasies arose in his mind, and he saw Samwise the Strong, hero of the age, striding with a flaming sword across the darkened land, and armies flocking to his call as he marched to the overthrow of Baradur. And then, all the clouds rolled away, and the white sun shone, and at his command the veil of Gorgoroth became a garden of flowers and trees, and brought forth fruit. He had only to put on the ring and claim it for his own, and all this could be. It's worth noting that Sam here has the One Ring, and not one of the rings subservient to it. Now what we must also keep in mind is that rings of power enhance the natural abilities of their wearer. The first part of Sam's vision, armies flocking to the call of Samwise the Strong, is remarkably similar to Boromir's vision, though only one of these characters would likely be capable of such a feat. A conclusion Sam comes to himself but also deep down in him lived still unconquered his plain hobbit sense. He knew in the core of his heart that he was not large enough to bear such a burden, even if such visions were not a mere cheat to betray him. The one small garden of a free gardener was all his need and due, not a garden swollen to a realm, his own hands to use, not the hands of others to command. 
Whatever short-term benefits hypothetical Hobbit ring bearers may receive, we need look no further than the Nine to know their eventual fate. These beings in time would be stretched far beyond their mortal lives, passing into the unseen world and becoming slaves under the One, halfling-sized Nazgul. Ironically, while hobbits would not have been powerful or important enough for Sauron to consider them for his adjusted plan, members of their race would possess a ring of power, his. Gollum alone would bear the One Ring for nearly 500 years, quite possibly longer than any of the Nazgul possess their own. With Sauron's change in his Rings of Power strategy, we see his ability to be flexible in his manipulation of others. While he didn't enslave elves, and hobbits were neither important nor on his radar, he successfully enslaves nine powerful and deadly servants, while also indirectly bringing about the downfall of multiple dwarven realms by way of dragons. We must also compliment Sauron on another thing, his ability to adjust his poetry. After all, the inscription that is engraved on his ruling ring, one ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them, is written when his plan was still to enslave the elves. Which means that nearly a hundred years later, after he knows the elves made three without him, captures the 16 rings in Eregion, and decides what to do with them, he completes the rest of the iconic ring verse, showing that like Tolkien himself, Sauron wasn't afraid to revisit his poetry. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Lissamy me the Cinda, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, CCDC Red Team, Joe Tepper, The Mighty Mim, Leo Vittori, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Berto Berg, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Micah Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.